The details of the fall of the great city and by consequence the global empire are then laid out for us. After all this I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority and the earth grew bright with his splendour. He gave a mighty shout. Babylon is fallen, that great city is fallen. She has become a home for demons, she is a hideout for every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture, and every foul and dreadful animal. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her because of her desires for extravagant luxury, the merchants of the world have grown rich. As the headquarters of the global empire, Jerusalem has become overridden with evil and is now the dwelling place of demons and foul spirits. This is why she must be destroyed. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. For her sins are piled as high as heaven, and God remembers her evil deeds. Do to her as she has done to others. Double her penalty for all her evil deeds. She brewed a cup of terror for others, so brewed twice as much for her. She glorified herself and lived in luxury, so match it now with torment and sorrow. She boasted in her heart, I am queen of my throne, I am no helpless widow, and I have no reason to mourn. Therefore these plagues will overtake her in a single day, death and mourning and famine. She will be completely consumed by fire, for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. Notice how Jerusalem doesn't seem to be concerned that she has lost her relationship with God. She says, I am no helpless widow and I have no reason to mourn. It's almost like she has reveled in her divorce from God. So here God is warning his people to come out of her because he is obliterating her along with the Antichrist world system. And the kings of the world who committed adultery with her and enjoyed her great luxury will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will cry out, How terrible, how terrible for you, O Babylon, you great city. In a single moment God's judgment came on you. The merchants of the world will weep and mourn for her, for there is no one left to buy their goods. She bought great quantities of gold, silver, jewels and pearls, fine linen, purple silk and scarlet cloth, things made of fragrant thigh and wood, ivory goods and objects made of expensive wood, and bronze, iron and marble. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots and bodies, that is, human slaves. The fancy things you love so much are gone, they cry. All your luxuries and splendor are gone forever, never to be yours again. The merchants who became wealthy by selling her these things will stand at a distance terrified by her great torment. They will weep and cry out. How terrible, how terrible for that great city. She was clothed in finest purple and scarlet linens, decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. In a single moment, all the wealth of the city is gone. And all the captains of the merchant ships and their passengers and sailors and crews will stand at a distance. They will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend and they will say, Where is there another city as great as this? And they will weep and throw dust on their heads to show their grief. And they will cry out, How terrible, how terrible for that great city. The ship owners became wealthy by transporting her great wealth on the seas. In a single moment it is all gone. Rejoice over her fate, O heaven, and people of God, and apostles and prophets, for at last God has judged her for your sakes. These passages tell us that the Antichrist capital city will become the centre of the world's wealth generating power. It will be the focus of global commerce. As such, it will be the wealthiest city in the world. We're starting to see the generation of wealth in the world centre on a few major cities already, in places like New York and London. But when the One World Order comes together, it's all going to centre on the Antichrist capital city, the one that encapsulates Babylon. The mention of ship captains standing at a distance mourning for her destruction is often misconstrued to mean that Babylon, the great city, is a port city and therefore that would rule out Jerusalem as a candidate. 
but the passage doesn't actually say that. It only says that all those who are involved in various branches of commerce and trade relied on that city and now stand from a distance, distraught as they watch it burn. Again, this makes sense if we understand that the false prophet will establish his global economic system from Jerusalem. Once the city is brought down into rubble, the entire world's economy will go into meltdown. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge millstone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, Just like this, the great city Babylon will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. The sound of harps, singers, flutes and trumpets will never be heard in you again. No craftsmen and no trades will ever be found in you again. The sound of the mill will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the greatest in the world, and you deceived the nations with your sorceries. In your streets flowed the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, and the blood of people slaughtered all over the world. The fact that the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people flowed through the streets of this city also seems to refer to Jacob's trouble, but with great violence the Lord will bring the Antichrist system down to nothing. God's people rejoice about this in heaven. Throughout our study, there have been clues that have led us to believe that the Antichrist will be Syrian and may even come from Damascus. Earlier on, you may remember I said that although the Assyrian Empire covered those Euphrates nations of Turkey, Iraq and Iran, I believed that Syria would be the most likely place of his birth. The reason I said that was because of a prophecy that Isaiah gave. In chapter 17 of his book, we read about a destruction of Jerusalem that seems to be linked to a simultaneous destruction of Damascus. This message came to me concerning Damascus. Look, the city of Damascus will disappear. It will become a heap of ruins. The towns of Aurora will be deserted. Flocks will graze in the streets and lie down undisturbed, with no one to chase them away. The fortified towns of Israel will also be destroyed, and the royal power of Damascus will end. All that remains of Syria will share the fate of Israel's departed glory, declares the Lord of Heaven's armies. In that day Israel's glory will grow dim, its robust body will waste away. The whole land will look like a grain field after the harvesters have gathered the grain. It will be desolate like the fields in the valley of Rephaim after the harvest. Only a few of its people will be left, like stray olives left on a tree after the harvest. Only two or three remain in the highest branches, four or five scattered here and there on the limbs, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. Then at last the people will look to their Creator and turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. They will no longer look to their idols for help or worship what their own hands have made. They will never again bow down to their Asherah poles or worship at the pagan shrines they have built. Their largest cities will be like a deserted forest, like the land the Hivites and Amorites abandoned, when the Israelites came here so long ago, it will be utterly desolate. Why? Because you have turned from the God who can save you. You have forgotten the rock who can hide you, so you may plant the finest grapevines and import the most expensive seedlings. They may sprout in the day you set them out. Yes, they may blossom on the very morning you plant them, but you will never pick any grapes from them. Your only harvest will be a load of grief and unrelieved pain. Listen, the armies of many nations roar like the roaring of the sea. Hear the thunder of the mighty forces as they rush forward like thundering waves. But though they thunder like breakers on a beach, God will silence them and they will run away. They will flee like chaff scattered by the wind, like a tumbleweed whirling before a storm. In the evening Israel waits in terror, but by dawn its enemies are dead. This is the just reward of those who plunder us, a fitting end for those who destroy us. This prophecy talks about a destruction of Damascus that coincides with a destruction of Israel. They have a shared fate. And we know that Israel is going to be destroyed around this time during Jacob's trouble. And then it says that the shared fate will happen after the harvesters have gathered the grain. And we have just been reading about the spiritual harvest of the earth at this time. The harvesters are God's angels gathering the elect from the earth. This is the time of God's harvest at the seventh trumpet. 
This prophecy also says that the world's largest cities will be like a deserted forest, and we have just been exploring how the cities of the world will be ruined by 75 pound hailstones at this time. This prophecy also tells us that the cities will be desolate, and we know that the abomination of desolation will lead to the desolation at this time. This prophecy also mentions the armies of the world coming together with a roar like the sea, and we've just been exploring how the armies of the world are going to gather together for the Battle of Armageddon at this exact time. This prophecy even mentions great vines of grief and unrelieved pain, which vividly recalls God's winepress metaphor of their destruction at this time. This prophecy also says that this will happen just before the second coming. Then at last the people will look to their creator and turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. So we know that this simultaneous destruction of Jerusalem and Damascus will happen right before Jesus' return, which is at this exact time. Why is the destruction of Damascus tied to the destruction of Jerusalem? It seems most likely that it's because the Antichrist will have a strong connection to Syria. This unfulfilled prophecy from Isaiah 17 was in the news a lot recently due to the civil war in Syria, and while many Christians speculated that we were about to witness the destruction of Damascus through that war, I would suggest that this is a prophecy that won't find fulfillment until the time of the very end. It seems that the Antichrist's hometown may be destroyed in conjunction with the destruction of Jerusalem, his power base, and that's what the connection is.